many of you are in with us, and I think it's really honorable to present my results for this famous audience. <laughs> I really think that it is. And uh, my topic is today is the development of academic performance and adaptation in the context of interpersonal relations among children and adolescents. So first, here is some outline of uh, research lines that I have been mostly been involved. And the uh, first one is uh, research on adolescent peer groups and networks. Uh, I have done my PhD on the role of adolescent peer groups in the school context in 2008, and uh, since then continued some postdoctoral works on this domain in different datasets, including also Finn Edu, this is familiar for some of you. And uh, well, this topic was already discussed in Siena workshop and with uh, Phil and Toria trying to figure out how to work on with their data. So I thought that uh, today I would mainly focus on these two other research lines in my talk. And uh, the second one uh, is kind of a future direction for my PhD dissertation, broaden the perspective uh, from uh, peer relations also to teacher and parent relations and to investigate different uh, interpersonal contexts simultaneously and what kind of role they have together in uh, students' academic performance adjustment. And I have been particularly interested in mediating and moderating uh, processes, and I will soon show some example studies from the, in this domain. And uh, during last few years, I have worked so quite some time to work with first steps data, so I will also uh, briefly tell you a little bit about what kind of data set that is. And uh, then uh, the third research line is the newest one. It's a new, new project uh, led by me and uh, Professor Timo Ahonen, stairway from primary school to secondary school. So hopefully I will have some time to share the design and some ideas of this study, and of course, any comments are also welcomed. We have we are now in the middle of data collection of uh, grade, uh, grade six uh, spring, but still some adaptations might be possible for grade seven. So in that sense, also <laughs> it might be possible to impact. And also, of course, we are interested in international collaboration too, so if you get interested in this project, please free, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, so first, a few words about first steps, longitudinal study. Here is uh, Finland's map, and uh, this uh, study sample uh, consists of about uh, 2,000 Finnish children, community sample from uh, four different Finnish cities, and uh, they are followed from kindergarten onwards up to grade nine. And uh, in the first phase, it includes uh, data collections in kindergarten and grades uh, one, two, three, and four. And in the second uh, phase of the study, it includes uh, data collections for grade 6, 7 and 9. And currently, uh, data has been collected up to 7th grade, so 9th grade data collection will be the next one. So it will, it's already quite unique, quite long follow-up of the same children and their teachers and peers. And in generally, the aim of the first step study is to identify uh, individual and structural as well as interactional processes that uh, foster or jeopardize the skill development, engagement, and motivation. And here is the group 
first business group. This project is led by uh, Jari Erik Nurmi, Anna Maja Poikkeus, Marek Mistina Leikkanen from University of Jyväskylä, and then also some, some people from Turku and uh, University of Joensuu. So it's kind of collaborative effort between different universities in Finland. And uh, this uh, this figure somehow illustrates some key ideas of this first steps study to study uh, learning interactions between children, parents, and teachers. And this project has also particular emphasis in learning related risks. So as I do uh, follow up of this uh, community sample of about two thousand children. This uh, data uh, consists also of more intensive follow-up of about 600 children, of, uh, which uh, about half has been identified as having risk for breathing disabilities in kindergarten and half with no risk. So for this subsample, there is a bit more extensive uh, battery of measures. And uh, this uh, shows uh, design of this study measurement points. So uh, throughout the time, individual tests and group, group tests have been carried out for children, or now they are already adolescents. And also uh, students and parents and teachers have been filling questionnaires. But then also uh, classroom observations have been carried out for a subsample. Not all the teachers, but, but part of them. So that also gives some possibilities to investigate a bit more real time processes. And also, in I think it was in se grade 7 data collection, and to some extent, also in grade 6 data collection. Also part of the data has been uh, collected via mobile phones that students have been filling their ratings in different classes. And uh, here is some summary about the, some key measures of this study. Different measures of cognitive skills and uh, academic skills, reading, spelling and writing, math skills, then uh, different aspects of motivation and then social relationships. And as this is longitudinal study, the idea is of course to have kind of repeat the same measurements of the same uh, constructs across time as much as it is possible, of course, in some developing skills. It's necessary to add some more difficult items and maybe remove some easier ones when uh, skills are developing, but basically the idea is that it will be interesting to study development. So uh, next I will present some research examples from this, this study uh, regarding my own research interests. Uh, this first study uh, focused on a uh, teacher perceived uh, supportive classroom climate as a protective factor against uh, detrimental effects of uh, learning and social risk factors on peer rejection. And uh, if we take uh, theoretical background, transactional theory of uh, risk and adaptation and also different protective models of resilience. It suggests that uh, it is not only risk factors alone, but they interplay between protective factors that determine side outcomes. But uh, however, quite few attempts have been made to investigate whether classroom level factors, such as uh, supportive classroom climate and small class size, in elementary school would buffer against prior risk factors. 
And uh, in this study, we made some predictions. We uh, expected that uh, social and learning related risks, they would uh, increase livelihood for peer rejection. And uh, this hypothesis was confirmed. Uh, kindergarten aids social withdrawal and disruptive behavior. Uh, they they uh, predicted higher level of peer rejection in grade one, and also uh, compared to children without uh, reading disability risk, those children who had this risk, <coughs> they faced more peer rejection in grade one. So this was kind of starting point that we were interested in those uh, moderating factors. And then other expectations, we, we thought that uh, detrimental impacts of uh, social and learning risk factors on peer rejections might be weaker if teacher would show higher support to the students in the classroom. And uh, we measured risk for reading disabilities uh, in terms of low achievement in both uh, phonological awareness and uh, letter knowledge. Uh, these factors have been consistently shown to be best proximal predictors of later reading skills and difficulties. And uh, for social risks, we used uh, social, socially withdrawn behavior and disruptive behavior and outcome was peer rejection measured via sociometric assessment. Yes? When you're talking about classroom climate, is that based upon uh, the teacher's self-rating? Yeah, uh, in this study it is. That's why I'm talking about teacher perceived. And, and, and do, you, do you also have uh, student ratings of the teacher? Uh, at this age, unfortunately, we don't have. Okay. <laughs> In this uh, other study, we will have that also. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, yes, classroom factors, teacher supportiveness in the classroom was measured as teacher rated affection to class, to students in the classroom. And uh, as uh, students were nested within classrooms, we used uh, multi-level models with uh, random slopes and uh, these models uh, enable to examine whether classroom factors would uh, moderate uh, the impact of individual level factors. Here is the model in the individual level, quite normal regression model to predictors and outcome, but then uh, these regression coefficients when made random, allowed to uh, vary between classrooms. So, if there is variation in the strength of the associations between these uh, risk factors and later outcomes, this, then this variation can also be predicted at the classroom level. And uh, the results showed that uh, supportive classroom Climate uh, reported by teacher. That's good to be in mind <laughs> that this was not based on observation, that it uh, protected against the detrimental uh, effect of reading disability risk on peer rejection, and also smaller class size. It protected against the detrimental effect of social withdrawal on peer rejection. And also we found some effects for teaching experience. Which we, we find a little bit something like this also in some other cause, and that's kind of longer discuss discussion to think, think about whether whether it is so that those who have shorter experience they are kind of have more uh, updated knowledge or whether those who have longer experience they are kind of already bit tired to their work or what is the explanation or some cultural thing or something. I guess that's well, that's, a big, <laughs> that, that's that's a major finding in the really <laughs> you're really <laughs> indictment on the profession. It's terrible, yeah. It's it's terrible. Are those standardized are they the, the yes, yeah. yeah. are those standardized coefficients? Yes. Oh wait a minute. The, 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 
we don't know what about the size of the moderation effects. We link the teaching experience point seven six is no 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 that's just defined that's a factor loading. Oh, that's a pass. So the class size is the class size. Smaller basis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Most used as, as a continuous variable. So, what would a small class size be? How many children? Well, in uh, Finland, that so maybe small would be uh, below 10 or something. Really? 10 to 15 might be. Kind of average, maybe 20 and more is not it is quite much. And yes? What's the relationship between the teacher's report of their climate and the uh, life that the teachers experience? Is there a, a correlation? Um, no, I don't remember my heart. I, I think I can check that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Apparently negative. So, uh, if we think some conclusions uh, in emotionally supportive classrooms, uh, interactions between teachers and students are characterized by positive tone, and the classroom atmosphere is respectful of the individual child. So, uh, this might uh, contribute to increased uh, process of peer interactions, maybe less bullying and maybe it might be easier for at-risk <coughs> at children to get integrated to the peer group, maybe there is more tolerance for different kind of children or something like that. And also uh, a teacher who for, forms a home and respectful connections with children and uh, as, as uh, Role model for problem solving in constructive ways might also promote social skills of students and maybe also help this. Can, can, so we, can, we, can we go back to that last and just explore it a little bit because I mean that's yeah, important. <laughs> <laughs> that's really true. Now, what you're saying is is that if a child has a risk factor they're more likely to be rejected if their teacher has lots of experience. That's scary enough. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's yes. Funny, and you, are we also fun. saying that um, what's the mean effect? That that's an interaction effect. What's the mean effect of uh, teacher experience? Is that negative as well? Well, now in this model we are just predicting these slopes, but I don't, regarding the in, that's the, yeah. The yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I think I should check the size of the correlation, but this is something that it's something that I don't, well, that there are potential explanations, but if this is not the only, Fighting well, my, 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 research, my research shows that teaching my research shows that teaching effectiveness goes down with age. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's not it's not inconsistent with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and your research sort of cohort effects, in other words, the changes in teacher training or the attitudes of teachers, yeah, um, like independent that. of the age of the teacher. And can you look at different cohorts to separate? Um, whether it's just due to the time that they were trained? That would be really interesting, but I think that's probably sample size doesn't yeah. allow us no, to no, So, then I would like to present the next, next example. And uh, this is about uh, social withdrawal as a moderator of associations between parenting styles and children's socio-emotional development. And as already discussed in previous, social withdrawal in uh, childhood is a risk factor for later socio-emotional difficulties and fear difficulties also. And uh, in this study it was examined uh, joint effects of children's social withdrawal and mothers and fathers' parenting styles on children's social emotional development. 
and uh, it was expected based on uh, diatesis, stress, vantage sensitivity and different uh, suggestibility models that uh, socially withdrawn children would be uh, particularly prone to parental influ influences. And uh, Belsky and colleagues, they have summarized these key differences between these theories quite nicely. Like uh, the diatesis the stress model, it suggests that uh, if you have a risk, if, if you are at the risk, then those children would be particularly uh, vulnerable for negative effects of the negative environment, negative parenting. Whereas uh, when this sensitivity is just uh, that uh, those risk children would particularly benefit from good, good parenting, supportive parenting. Whereas uh, differential suggestibility models just says that uh, it gener in general uh, at risk children would be more suggestible to parental influences, both negative and positive. And uh, here is a table that I will walk you through uh, to test uh, these uh, competing theories. We used a uh, region of significance analysis when we investigated uh, the these interaction effects between uh, social withdrawal and parenting styles. And uh, this enables us to go a little bit deeper in comparing whether we will get uh, evidence uh, for or against each of these theories. And uh, here are first uh, regression estimates intercept and then regression estimates for parenting styles and uh, then for social withdrawal and then interaction effects. Only those uh, are uh, shown here in the figure in which uh, interaction effect was significant between type, uh, social withdrawal and parenting style. And then these uh, reasons of uh, significance uh, regarding Z, that is uh, social withdrawal, it shows uh, ra range, uh, range, uh, ranges of values of uh, social withdrawal in which uh, parenting styles and uh, socio-emotional development are significantly associated, whereas uh, these reasons of significance uh, of uh, parenting styles, X, uh, that it shows reasons of values uh, in, in out, kind of out, outside these region, regions where uh, when uh, this social withdrawal and uh, so, so emotional development are significantly uh, associated when the lines, regression lines, kind of are different from each other. And uh, then, uh, well, this, as well as significance testing, also these reasons of significance, they are sensitive to sample size. So, uh, we also calculated this for proportional interaction uh, index suggested by Roisman and colleague, which kind of uh, calculates from these reasons uh, proportion of uh, region of significance that is uh, towards uh, positive effects of parenting or towards uh, negative effects of parenting for uh, these risk children as if this proportional interaction uh, interaction index is about 0.50, 0.40, 60. It would tell, provide evidence for uh, different uh, suggestibility theory, whereas if it's close to 1 or 0, then depending on your coding on your variables, then it would support uh, either advantage sensitivity or catalysis stress theory. Um, you probably are not able to read this, but this figure illustrates some of these uh, findings, some interactions, and uh, 
here the black line it uh, represent uh, regression line of from parenting to uh, social emotional development for those children who are high in social withdrawal and that whereas a gray, gray line reverse to represents regression line for those children who are low in social withdrawal and then these gray, gray areas uh, they describe the area when these regression lines are statistically significantly different and uh, well what we can see as a general pattern in general it seems to be that uh, this uh, association of parenting styles with uh, social emotional development is stronger for socially withdrawn children whereas uh, those who show only little signs of social withdrawal mostly if there is no association or very small and uh, if I would well then we have also some other figures but I don't that I will I will not show all of them as it's maybe easier to summarize this could, could you go back to that yes um, this, I'm surprised that some of the lines are going in opposite direction yeah it is, it is uh, I, I think, I, are yes there, because that's yes. saying that better parenting yes may not be helpful yes. for yeah. it may even be negative uh, yes. for kids that are uh, don't have risk factors. Is that well, uh, actually, I guess they're probably those, not significant. In, well, in the, those cases, it's psychological control. But well, oh, well, the opposite. Yeah. Uh, well, do, do you mean these lines for non-withdrawal children or? Okay. So psychological control. So it's super low psychological control. Mm. May not be. It usually is considered more positive, but. I mean, there's a level where psychological control is too low. Um, um, yeah, but usually psychological control is thought kind of negative, it's kind negative. of parenting guilt inducing parenting. So, regarding this, uh, okay. this last, there, there are some, some unexpected results, but on the other hand, uh, regarding theory, those for internalizing. It's, it shows what we expect, so I guess we have some uh, explanations, or at least we think that it might be so that, uh, well, if parents are a lot of uh, psychological control, then it, it might uh, decrease this uh, vulnerable children's uh, problem behaviors, kind of in superficial level, they will behave better, but because uh, if the parents are high level of psychological control, then uh, children, these risk children's uh, internalizing problems increase, so maybe they suffer internally or somehow those withdrawn children are what to please they, yes? Can, can I also just check because um, control is of two different kinds. Yes. So there's authoritarian control, which we know is bad, but there's authoritative control. Uh, about which there's some good results. So it depends what the items are in the scale. Yeah, we, in this study we had three dimensions of uh, parenting. Uh, it was affection and behavioral control and psychological control. So affection and behavioral yes. control and psychological control. Behavioral control is mainly kind of rule setting and more like demanding this aspect. Whereas this psychological control is guilt inducing. Guilt inducing. Parenting, like that, say, friends should kind of somehow be grateful for all of the efforts that I'm doing for them and not maybe expected, <laughs> accepting them as they, they are, but somehow. It also suggests maybe there's a quadratic component. Mm so that there's some sort of optimal level that's between yes. the two extremes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But yeah, re regarding uh, maternal affection, the results supported uh, diagnosis stress 
what else I was just saying that uh, love maternal affection was very, very bad for socially withdrawn children, whereas uh, for psychological control, this pattern was is more complex. But of course, it would be interesting to still go deeper to investigate this. What is actually going on? Time. I have one more uh, research example, and then I was thinking to move the presentation about that stairway study. So I guess I'm still okay. Uh, so in this study, uh, we investigated uh, combined effects of uh, teacher and peer relations in prediction of students' academic skill development, and. Uh, as a background, many theories of motivation, of which some uh, very well-respected developers are also in this room, have suggested that uh, supportive interpersonal environments are an uh, important resource for the promotion of children's academic performance. For example, we are meeting this basic need of relatedness if they feel uh, if students feel that they are accepted and they have close relations with peers and parents in the school context, they might be more, more motivated and make more effort and this may also increase their academic performance. But uh, however, researchers have quite rarely invested Considers the role of teachers in students' uh, peer relations mm -hmm. and uh, possible indirect consequences to student outcomes. Uh, uh, for example, we can think that uh, teachers have the opportunity to manage classroom interactions and try to help low accepting students to develop new social roles, maybe enhance their peer relationships and generally uh, promote pro-social interaction among the students in the class. And it might be so that one uh, possible means by which students could uh, also promote the students' academic development performance would be via improving peer relations in the classroom. And uh, as we know that these very early primary years of schooling they have long-lasting effects of later outcomes kind of your students get first experiences of schools first uh, successes and failures first experiences how accepted or non-accepted they are by peers and how they get along with teachers so typically these experiences might accumulate either in positive or ne negative direction. So I think it's important to study these dynamics also at the be very beginning of the school career. And uh, in this study, uh, it was first step study, and the students were followed from kindergarten to grade four, and uh, it was investigated cross. Uh, cross lacked associations between positive teacher affect toward the student. It was operationalized questions like to what extent uh, teachers uh, experience positive effects for students in teaching situations. So these associations between positive teacher affect and peer acceptance, but uh, main aim was in this mediating mechanisms through which uh, teacher and peer relations might combine to credit students' academic performance and also uh, mediating mechanisms through which academic skills in kindergarten might predict later teacher, peer and teacher relations. And uh, here, here are the results. So uh, the results show that uh, positive teacher, teacher effect was uh, it predicted higher level of peer acceptance across time and vice versa after controlling for 
previous levels of these constructs, but uh, also uh, children's early academic skills in kindergarten, they were also associated with better, better quality interpersonal relationships at the beginning of schooling, and uh, also positive teacher effect and peer acceptance posi were positively predicted later academic skills and also these different indirect effects were found. Here is a table of that, but probably I will summarize them in this slide. So, uh, it was found that uh, the, the effect of positive teacher effect on students' later academic skills, it was partially uh, mediated via peer acceptance, whereas also the effect of peer acceptance on later academic skills was partly mediated via positive teacher effect. And uh, in addition, uh, academic skills uh, in kindergarten not only predicted on students' later, later peer acceptance, but did so through positive teacher effect as well as academic skills in kindergarten predicted later positive teacher effect through peer acceptance. So dynamics was found kind of in many directions. And uh, what we could think about these results, uh, I guess that uh, interventions and uh, changes in school policies that would contribute to enhance uh, primary school teachers' ability to connect uh, emotionally supportive ways with students. It might prevent accumulation of non-supportive classroom experiences. And uh, also teachers should understand the importance of their attitudes they have towards different uh, students and what kind of consequences these might have. Uh, for example, if a uh, teacher shows positive uh, interaction with certain students, it might also uh, lead to other students to see that student more positively or vice versa. And also, teacher might somehow somehow communicate through, through via quality of interactions with different students what kind of values and attributes and characteristics she values. And teacher is, of course, a very important role model at the beginning of school career. It has to be remembered all the time that now we are talking about first four years of school career, so the phenomena might be very different in adolescence. It might be that being a teacher's pet might not be anymore so cool, and there might be quite different dynamics. So you're saying it's good to be the teacher's pet? <laughs> well... <laughs> well, um, well, there's a bit of a frame of reference in there. So if you increase the supportiveness completely, you know, if you, absolutely, you wouldn't change the rank order. Mm. Uh, and that's a, that's an interesting. Yeah, one. that's true. Yeah. That would be yeah. very interesting to investigate. This both at the classroom, like I know overall quality, and then mm. quality with different individual children. So yes, this, this is true that this is this study concerns only kind of uh, dyadic <laughs> relations. So that would be one phenomenon. And uh, also the results suggest that uh, mm. student acceptance by peer group predicts teacher effect for the students. And of course, that's also something that it would be good to be aware. Of course, there might be many mediating mechanisms, like maybe lots of this less accepted, students might be less motivated or lower self-concept or some <laughs> other phenomena that it, I don't expect that it is necessarily in real life like this uh, straight arrow, but it might be interesting to kind of add it up a bit more with this 
behind that association. Okay, then I would like to move to the last part of my presentation. I will try to do it fast so that you have some time for questions too. So I would like to say a few words about this new study, stairway study. And uh, here is our research group. It's, this project is funded by the Academy of Finland and of course I have to be very grateful for this great group of people. Without these people this wouldn't be possible. <coughs> and uh, if I say just quickly a few words of background for this uh, study. The focus is in the transition from uh, primary school to lower secondary school. And um, this transition it occurs in uh, early adolescence and at the, at the time of uh, rapid biological changes. And also in this transition, uh, students need to face new academic challenges. Often they face new peers and also subject teachers. At least in Finland, in primary school, uh, students still have one classroom teacher who, who is uh, teaching most of the subjects. Well, they might have like different teachers in sports, but like most academic subjects are taught by the same teacher. But then when they move to lower secondary school, they have many teachers in different subjects and it's not anymore so clearly that there is one teacher for whom they are close and who know them well. And so, it's the same here. Yeah. <laughs> and this changes this are stressful for some students and uh, previous research, uh, which always, while of some has been carried out in the US, has observed declines in well being and motivation and school grades across the transition. And uh, in this study, uh, we aim to broaden understanding of individual and environment related factors uh, that would promote learning, school well being, and successful transition from primary school to lower secondary school. And uh, some of our key aims are uh, how uh, emotion, motivation, and cognition in uh, challenging and non challenging achievement situations jointly contribute to students' learning and adjustment. Uh, second, uh, to what extent students' characteristics, uh, such as learning difficulties and temperament, as well as students' social relationships and the interactions between these, would contribute to students' functioning in challenging and versus non-challenging challenging situations. And also, uh, we Via what mechanisms student characteristics, interpersonal relationships, and functioning in these actual achievement situations would promote versus hinder student successful transition in regards to different learning and adjustment outcomes. And uh, here is some schematic model of this study. So, uh, as I guess I'm not going to de into details, but in general we are investigated of kind of different individual and environmental uh, factors that could promote this uh, successful transition, but then we are also interested in uh, go a bit deeper in dynamics in uh, achievement situations like interaction between functioning of autonomous nervous system as well as individual conscious experience of emotions and cognitive appraisals and how all of these uh, all of these might be connected to later outcomes and of course that we have special interest in temperament and <coughs> learning you, you didn't factors. talk about very much about the causal attributions. Is that is that like an internal external or is it more uh, are more detailed than that? Uh, well, in this we have causal attributes. Well, I will soon uh, describe the uh, experiment that we have, but uh, we we measure the causal attributions or ask the causal attributions 
after they have done those challenging and non-challenging tasks, like whether they, they think they succeeded or not, and for what reason they, they think that it was so. And uh, this data comprises Finnish early adolescents, about 800 students born in 2002, and their parents and teachers from two municipalities, and uh, intensive longitudinal data across this transition will be collected regarding individual dispositions, environmental factors, academic skills, motivation, learning related emotions, and school well-being. But also a subsample of students participate for an experiment which provides real-time information on emotional and motivational processes. And in fact, we have selected this subsample based on the uh, achievement scores in reading and math in the fall measurement. So we have selected those who, who, are, who have difficulties in math, difficulties in reading, and then uh, comparison group. Uh, here is the design. Uh, in order to be able to go to dynamics, what's going on in this during this transition, uh, we of course need intensive measurements. So we we are measuring these students twice per year. So it's kind of very intensive, like all the time when you have now data collection on, then you already have to plan the next one. Huh? Well, you know. And uh, now. How early yeah. in the autumn do you collect the uh, teacher and parent questions? How, how soon? Uh, we, well, for sixth grade data we collected, it was in the end of September and in October. When we and, and school begins when? Uh, in August, mid August, something like that. Mm -hmm. but, but then we have a kind of uh, well parent questionnaires and teacher questionnaires are collected always in the fall, but then teacher ratings are collected in spring because we were thinking that they probably, particularly after the transition, probably they don't know the students well enough that they would rate them early in, in the fall, and also to divide uh, teachers' workloads that this would, would not be too much. Uh, so we have uh, already collected this, this data, and most of it has already been entered in the computer and several of my students are already uh, working on it, but of course there is, are still many checkings going on. And, but now we are in the middle of this data collection. So uh, we are, on the other hand, we, we are collecting, well in this spring we have some measures on working memory and then questionnaires, but then we have this ex experiment going now and I will soon tell how, how this all ha has been realized. And I guess that in the spring we have to do some final this, uh, decision about the new planning the seventh grade data collection, so as mentioned it's possible to make some suggestions. And a uh, li little bit about this uh, experiment. So this is controlled experiment, not experiment in the se sense that it will be uh, randomized, but rather we have selected those interesting subgroups for the uh, experiment. But the situation is controlled. We control what is what students are doing now and next, and what questionnaire and so on. And uh, this uh, experiment consists of uh, hard and easy tasks, and they involve uh, reading, math, and re reasoning. And uh, this uh, difficulty level is adapted to students' own level based on their achievement scores in the fall. So, in that way, when we have constructed different difficulty levels, we believe that we are able to administer difficult and easy 
task for everybody in terms that we don't face the problem that well we wanted to give them difficult task, but actually it was easy for some people. And um, yes. Next more about this method during this experiment. Uh, we, uh, we record uh, participants' facial manifestations of emotions and also uh, psychophysiological states and reactions, uh, particularly heart rate, heart rate variability, and electrodermal activity or skin conductance throughout the experiment to obtain information uh, about attention, activeness, relaxation, stress and emotion regu regulation from a physiological standpoint. But also uh, participants feel uh, sort worries on their success, expectations, interest, expected difficulty, effort and emotions before each task, as well as uh, short queries after the tasks on retrospective emotions, how they felt during the task, as well as after task emotions, such as relief and certain things we are uh, adapted uh, questionnaires or ideas from Petrus work here. And uh, then also perceptions of difficulty, effort, performance and then causal attributions. Sorry, what causal attributions? What are, what are causal attributions? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, well, yeah. I don't, I don't know whether I explain it well, oh, well, well enough, but it, it's after the task they are asked like that whether you think that you succeeded or failed, and uh, if you succeeded, uh, for what reasons it was it, and then we have this. Well, external reasons or internal and so on, or similar for failures. And also there are some uh, naturalizing tasks between them. Do you, do you also have measures of eh? metacognition? Eh? Yes, I mean, eh? um, because metacognition seems to be gaining in importance. Eh? Well, I don't. I think that we have exactly maybe measure targeted to that, but it might be nice to discuss about the questions that you have used, whether we have anything close or whether there is something that you would think relevant to be added. Well, the children's perceptions of difficulty yes. Yes. would be contributing to their reflection on their capacity as a learner. Thinking skills and so on, mm. which is maybe what we do. <laughs> and uh, well, then I have uh, some summary of the measures that we have: reading skills, math skills, nonverbal ability, and also working memory. We are uh, well. We have in that individual test, but we really have also individual test for that. But then we have also adapted working memory task, reading and counting uh, span tasks with tablets so that we are now collecting data also in uh, class situations so that we are able to get at least some score for all the students. Of course, there are some challenges in that kind of measurement also because it, of course the situation should be quiet because if some disturbance comes then it might be that memory is emptied but I think generally uh, students have taken these tablets very, very well and hopefully this will work out. And uh, then school grades, individual tests, maybe. Well, maybe I tell a little bit about this psychophysiological assessments. Uh, we, we have hired a caravan for this spring. So that's how we are collecting the data from schools. So we have that's we have spring, kind yeah. of <laughs> 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 we have the laboratory that we have built in to that caravan. And then the 
students are making uh, tasks with computer and also with some individual paper, fancy to these tasks. That is still on the street, right? <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> now. <laughs> it has been some challenges with the matter, but I think <laughs> now we are the better side of already. <laughs> but uh, yeah, January and February, it was sometimes unpredictable with the ice and everything. It doesn't work. It's really so heavy and... It doesn't look real sunny either. <laughs> <laughs> or warm. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, regarding these psychophysiological assessments, we have this uh, me me the disease to measure heartbeat, heartbeat uh, variability um, developed by First beat, first beat systems, and uh, then we have also a finger pulse volume, which also provides a bit similar but complementary in information of, of this. And then, then this uh, we, we have uh, we have skin conduct, we measure skin conductance. We have elect electrodes in electrodes in these palms. So this is kind of we measure sweating. So these are kind of physiological um, responses that we expect that if if uh, arousal is higher or you get anxious, then heartbeat is expected to uh, raise, and uh, then also you start to sweat more. And uh, whereas if you relax, it will go to opposite direction. So. These are things that we are interested in, and uh, also uh, we we have recorded these sessions, and uh, we are analyzing uh, facial manifestations of emotions with the face reader, and uh, this uh, face reader it. Uh, it kind of analyzes, it first recognizes the face and then analyzes several different points and muscles in, in your face and it recognizes basic emotions like ang angry and happy and sad and content is the, is the last and it also provides balance like positive or neg negative. So this is one, one way how we try. Uh, yes, I love those psychophysiological measurements to assess uh, emotions more objectively as well. And of course, it's interesting to compare them to self reports and subjective yeah. experience and what is really conscious and what is not. And tell, tell us a little bit more about that because I, I, I have never used that. Mm -hmm. uh, how how valid, how reliable, and so forth. And how how well does it correlate with uh, with observational ratings and stuff like that? I think uh, well, in this uh, student samples, I'm not sure whether so much validation studies have been carried out. But for adult samples, I think there are some. At least they claim that this would be quite reliable. But maybe was it happy? And there are certain emotions that. They recognize more, more, uh, or actually maybe fear was the one that it recognizes more reliably. And then for other emotions, it, it's not that easy. But they at least report quite, quite high reliability. But this is what we will see. I think this is very interesting, and this is also new, brand new things for me. Also, these psychological things and. Fascinated by by them, but um, it will be interesting. Thing we have already carried out some very first tries, and basically, you use it, it. It looks working, but of course we have some problems with some students also. That even though instruction is that they should sit like this and <laughs> look computer screen, but we have some hyperactive or moderately restless people who are all the time like this, so then, of course, face reader, there is a lot of time and face reader cannot recognize their face, so that, that's of course, that we probably cannot have complete data for everybody, but we don't have yet 
any empty cup results. But we have um, after this week we have uh, collected this data for half of the sample about nine, 90 students and I've been reading videos into the face reader so I guess that we will get some first. Is it, is it uh, coding for engagement on this? Um, Sorry? How, do you, how, how is the engagement coded on this? Is, have you, when they, there's, you said there were seven emotions that you're getting from this, and I've seen in some of the facial recognition things that they have a code for engagement. Do you have that up here? I don't think we have clearly that we have just that these basic, basic emotions. Because that also involves the furrowed brow, it usually it doesn't have a happy configuration with it. There's kind of, so there's a set of things that has gone along with engagement that seem pretty important in this uh, sphere. And I'm just wondering if that's mm. already built into the system. No, not directly. I'm also thinking, have been thinking when I look in these videos that sometimes when a student is very concentrated, it's looking like this, yeah. Yeah. it <laughs> yeah. cannot yeah. recognize it correctly, and also as but we were analyzing like first video and there was it was also recognizing some discuss or content then I was a bit thin right. of course not not as a main emotion but a little bit like well is this yeah. kind of real but whenever in public be... whenever in public speaking the whole audience looks disgusted. classroom observation data, but what we have tried to do is to ask the same thing repeatedly and same, uh, ask the same thing from as many perspectives as possible. Adolescents, parents, teachers, peers, observers. So hopefully we will be successful. But how, but it, how are you defining school well day? Uh, well, I guess in this list I just uh, uh, added some broad, uh, broad concepts, but what we have measured, we have uh, like school, school satisfaction and school related stress and yeah. kind of coping with that school related yeah. stress, but then we have also measures for overall well being and problem behaviors, <laughs> things like that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.